Take your Bibles, please. Turn to the book of Esther, Esther chapter 3. I appreciate that. While you're turning there, let me just say I appreciate um, this place and this pastor and you people. You're always so kind to us when we're here. I am thrilled that my family's here with me. They, they, they look to this place like it's, a, 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 like it's their home. It's like coming home to them. We have so many friends here and so many memories and so many things. And for me to be here with them and let them enjoy this too is, is a blessing to me. You know, the, the theme of the meeting every year with the truth, friendship, and world evangelism, friendship is so important. I, I, I appreciate um, the Sexton's friendship over all these years. I, I, I think you remember, because you remember most everything, but um, uh, I, I was going through a difficult time in the early days of our church. And, um, and I was hurting and I didn't know who to talk to and just, just feeling the pressure of, you know, just, just not knowing what to do. And, and, um, you were preaching, you, you, you were invited to preach for the tree out the pastor's conference out there. And, uh, that's about the closest you were going to be to me since, since I had left school and you had gone to Patterson, you were in Patterson at the time. And, and I, uh, I, 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 I made plans to go to the meeting and I told, uh, uh, Dr. Treber, I said, could I have a, a, a t- could I schedule a time to see Brother Sexton? And I came in the room there, and um, I don't know what to say. I just looked at you and I said, I just need a friend. And I burst into tears. I'm not a crier. I don't think anything wrong with men crying. I just don't think it's practical. It doesn't help anything, you know. <laughs> when you're done, you still have to solve the same problems. <laughs> it just doesn't. So, but that surprised me. It shocked me that I felt so... Um, willing to bear my heart to this friend of mine. And I thank you for you and Evelyn, your friendship over the years. It's meaningful to me and to our family. I feel tonight, you know, we've, I've gone on so many things with youth over the years and trips and things. And, and uh, you know, they get a bunch of teenagers in a van, they want to play games. And I remember one of the games kids used to play uh, was, uh, you know, my father owned a grocery store. And they just started around the van. They said the first one had to say something with letter A, like my father owned a grocery store and he sold apples. The next one had to say my father owned a grocery store and he sold apples. And they had to say something with a B and say bananas. And then the next one said my father owned a grocery store and he sold apples, bananas, and cucumbers. And they went down the list, see how far they could go until somebody messed up. I feel that way tonight. I feel like the meeting so far is just it's building. And I'm going to add one thought to it this morning was... Was 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 confronting unbelief in the sense of uh, of 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 of, of, uh, of we need to believe trust God by faith. Uh, uh, Doctor Reynolds appreciate so much. And then Brother Morland t- uh, uh, this morning on 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 uh, on on on, on uh, you know, uh, the idea of dying. When did you die? If we're going to trust God by faith, and we need to die to ourselves, and it, the meeting's building, and I I, I certainly don't want to. Uh, do anything to squash that tonight, but I certainly would like to add a thought to it. And um, uh, I, I want to ask you this thought. Where, where is the urgency? I don't think a thing will be said this week by any preacher, by any speaker, that everybody here wouldn't say, I believe that. That's true. We'll talk about the need for world evangelism. People say, well, that's true. We'll talk about the need for churches. Everybody will like, agree. We need churches. We'll talk about the condition of our country. And people say, oh, I agree with that. I agree with that. That's right. And, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're in dire straits. And we'll, you know, we're, we're, everything, everything anybody says here, every one of us in this room are going to say, amen. That's right. But where is the urgency? With that thought in mind, would you look with me? at the book of Esther. You know the story. I think everybody here probably knows this story well. Esther has become queen, queen in the place of Vashti with, to, 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 to uh, King Ahasuerus. He's king of a vast empire. The Bible tells us in chapter 1 and verse 1 that, that this empire was 127 provinces uh, spanning from India to Ethiopia. If you just look at a map today and consider that span, India to Ethiopia, and uh, 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 and and over this great realm. And again, just in quick summary, you know, uh, he had a right hand man by other uh, Haman, and Haman hated Mordecai, who was a Jew, but didn't feel like he could go after Mordecai personally. So he decided, after all the Jews, to destroy them. 
Beginning in verse 8 of chapter 3, the Bible says, And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of uh, thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. Jump down to verse 12. It says, then, the, then, then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had uh, commanded unto the king's uh, lieutenants and to the governors and that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people in every province, according to, to uh, the writing thereof, uh, and to every people after uh, their language, in the name of, uh, of uh, King Ahasuerus, was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the, leader, and, uh, and, uh, the letters were sent by post unto all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is of the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God, and we pray that we might draw something from it this evening that would stir us, that would help us, Lord, to understand your heart, to understand your desire for our lives, and to and to truly buy into it, to truly give ourselves to your will for our lives. Lord, we, we know you have a heart for the people of this world. You love them so much you sent your son to die. May we understand our part in expressing and showing and living out your love for these people. Please, Lord, speak to our hearts tonight. And may we develop in our own hearts and lives an urgency about this matter. Amen. And we'll thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in verse 14 that the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. There was a day set. There was even a, there was a point, a specific day. The time was set. The Jewish people of this realm had about 11 months, basically, to live. The date was set. This writing, according to verse 12, says that it took place on the first month, the 13th day of the first month, and the date was set for the 13th day of the 12th month. So they had 11 months. We look ahead and wonder how much time we as a nation have. Well, how much time we as, uh, as people have. We don't know when the Lord's going to come. We don't have a specific time set. But we certainly, many of us, uh, most of us feel like the time seems to be short. But they had a specific time set. And so the Bible says in verse 15, The post went out, being hastened by the king's uh, commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan the palace, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, and the city Shushan was perplexed. God's word tells us that the word went out. And they sat down like it was no big deal. Just sit down, relax, and wait for the 11 months to pass, and on a specific day all the Jews would be killed. And they sit back and take the next thing on the king's business. Like it's just not a big deal. But the Bible says in chapter 4 and verse 1, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried a loud and bitter cry. To Haman and to the king and to the palace and to the people of his realm. This was not a big deal, but to Mordecai, it was his life and the life of his people. Things changed that day for Mordecai. 
Mordecai prayed like he'd never prayed before. He cried like he'd never cried before. You say, oh, well, it's there's plenty of time. There's 11 months to figure out what to do about this. No, no, it was, time was set. Can you imagine what Mordecai felt like to know that the time had been set for his own destruction? It says in verse 2, and, and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. He's in sackcloth, but he comes. It doesn't matter. Clothing at that point, which what he's wearing doesn't matter. He's got to get help. The Bible tells you in verse 3, And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment, his, his uh, decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Not only Mordecai, but the Jews in each province as the word got to them and urgency fell upon them an urgency the word urgency is defined in Webster's 1828 dictionary as the pressure of necessity the pressure of something that has to be done a modern dictionary says this that urgency is the pressing importance requiring speedy action. Urgency. We all agree that the world is in terrible trouble spiritually, but do we feel the pressure that requires speedy action? Do we feel the pressure of necessity or is it just another conversation over coffee? urgency in verses 4 through the end of the chapter 4 Mordecai goes to Esther who is now the the queen and I'm sure he felt that this may be their only hope to try to get word to Esther maybe she's in a position to help and like many I think Esther at the beginning of this does not see the urgency in fact it's almost humorous when verse 4 we read, So Esther's maids and her chamberlains uh, came and, and told it her. They said, Mordecai is at the gate and he's wearing sackcloth and ashes. You can't come to, uh, to the court with sackcloth and ashes. And the Bible says, Then was the queen exceedingly grieved and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai to take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. Esther's first response is to see, well, the problem here is that Mordecai needs to be dressed better. She missed completely why Mordecai was in sackcloth and ashes. Either she may not have known yet. Maybe it hadn't been explained. It seems that he explains that coming up in the next few verses. But I... I think there are many around the country today, and I'm sorry, I think there are many Christians in fundamental circles who just don't really get the urgency. They see some other problem, some other part of the difficulty. Say, oh, if we're having problems, maybe we'll change our services, be more contemporary, we'll get more people, and they don't see the urgency. We'll just, we'll just we'll change the clothing. We'll just, come on, you just... They don't see the urgency. Mordecai explains to Esther. Mordecai told the, the man who came down, said in, in verse 7, Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And he gave him a copy, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was at Shushan. He explains this to her. Then she makes excuses. They were honest excuses, by the way. What she said was true. She said, now, Uncle Mordecai, you don't understand. You don't go to the king without being invited. It's just, that's not the way we do it. It doesn't work that way. 
You see, the king, if you come in without being invited, you're killed unless the king happens to raise his scepter. You're risking your life to do that. Mordecai's answer is interesting. He says, do you not understand that you're a Jew? You're not going to get through this unscathed. You're in trouble too. And then he presses her with this question. He says, he says to her, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? You and I are alive today and saved and born again and chi- children of our, of our God and Savior. And we're here at this moment for such a time as this. I don't know, uh, you, would, would, you might think, I, I've met many people who said, boy, I wish I, I wish I was alive in the cowboy days. I'd have been a fast gun or something. Or I wish I was alive in the 18th, you know, dressed in the, in the, in the fancy gowns. And the, you know, you, you, not, not me in the fancy gowns, by the way, but um, people have said that. You know. Maybe people think of another time they would have liked to have lived, but the, but the truth is that we're alive today. We're alive in the time when our faith is attacked the way it is today. We're alive in the day when, when, when our country is going the direction it's going. We're alive today when religion itself is, 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 is being attacked in every sense of it. We, <laughs> I saved when I was 22 years old. I, I, I wasn't a Christian. As far as, I, as far as I know, some of you folks who or here in church, you, you know, I've, I've, I've said this before, but uh, when I was saved, as far as I know, I was the very first person ever saved in my family history. I didn't have an aunt, an uncle, cousin, nephew, uh, brother, sister, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. Nobody I knew was saved. Nobody I knew was a Christian. As far as I know, to this day, I was the very first, first person ever saved in my uh, family history. I didn't, I, I didn't know what all this meant. Somebody said, well, we're fundamentalists. I said, sounds good to me. It meant I believed the Bible. It meant I wanted to stand for what the Bible said. It meant I wanted to walk with God and be close to God and, 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 and be sincere and serious about his word and, and all the things that I thought it meant to be a fundamentalist. Now they're, now they're comparing it with, with, with terrorists, to use the word fundamentalism. It's a strange day. Do you know all it takes to make somebody a radical? Now, when I say radical, I mean as a fundamental Bible-believing Christian. Do you know, do you know 35 years ago when we started our church, I would have been considered kind of maybe a moderate. Today I'm a radical. You say, well, why'd you change? I haven't. You know, all it takes to make a radical is everybody else changes. I mean, I mean, think with me for a minute, okay? I say, I say, well, we we, we use the King James, and I got a hundred other pastor friends say, we all use the King James. Ninety-five of those change now; they're using other stuff. And look back over here, going, man, you guys are radical. You guys are dinosaurs. You guys are ridiculous. You know, all it takes to make somebody radical is everybody else change. No, we're here for this time. We're here for such a time as this. I, 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 I mean this with all the sincerity of my heart. I tell our folks back home, people say, well, the world's getting darker spiritually. Exactly right. And the darker it gets, the brighter light shines. One of those fancy phones with a flashlight on it. And if I go and I turn on my flashlight, if I can, I turn on my flashlight here, and it makes no difference at all. But you turn all these lights out and make the thing as dark as it can be, that that lie will mean a lot. It'll make a big impact. Man, the darker this world gets, the more chance we have to make an impact. If we'll walk as light. 
if we'll walk in the light as he is in the light. We've come to a time, such a time as this, where this is where we are, this is where God brought us, this is where we've been given life and we've been given opportunity, we've been, been, uh, been uh, given ministry. Mordecai said to Esther, this is why you're here. You're here now for this time. There's an urgency about it. And Esther got it. Some don't ever get it, but Esther got it. She said, okay, I get it. She said, you fast and you pray. There it is again. Once she understood it, it changed her prayer life. She said, you pray, you fast for three days. I'll pray. Our people here will pray and fast for three days. And then I'll be, go before the king. And if I perish, I perish. The urgency changed her whole mindset. The urgency caused her to pray different, caused her to think different, and caused her to be willing to sacrifice even her own life if necessary because she got the urgency. It became real to her. What needed to happen? You know the story. I've said it probably two or three times already. I... Uh, summarize a few things. This next, next few chapters, you know, she goes to the king and she invites the king and Haman to a dinner and finally she reveals what Haman's doing and uh, Haman is, 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 is hung on his own gallows and we get over to chapter 8. He says, it says on that day, in verse 1, did the king of Ashes give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen? And Mordecai came before the king, and uh, for Esther had told what he was unto her. And so, and boy, they've won the victory over Haman. And, but the problem still exists. You know, that decree is still out there. The posts are still going. The messengers are still going for over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. They're still out there telling of the, uh, uh, of the decree of the king because under the law of, of the Medes and of the Persians, that can't be reversed. The problem still exists. Thank God for the present victory. Thank God for the, uh, for the victory uh, personally um, over Haman. But, but the problem's still out there. The Bible says in verse 3, And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman of the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it Please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised uh, uh, by Haman, the son of Hamaditha, or the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the all of the king's promises. Notice verse 6. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come upon my people? The urgency had become personal now to her. How can I endure, she says. Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? We all agree that in many places, fundamental Bible-believing Christianity is in trouble. You say, how can I endure? They're attacking my Bible. They're attacking my faith. They're attacking everything I believe in. How can I endure? Well, I'll just make sure that we're okay where we are. Our church is doing pretty good in Spokane. So we're good. We're good. That's not enough. How can we endure? She says, no, no, no. Something's got to happen. It's got to, to be dealt with. 
Then King Asher said to Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. He said, look, it, we, we need to send out another letter. <laughs> he said, we can't reverse what was said, but we can give them the opportunity to defend themselves. We can say on that day that all the Jews can come together, they get the palace, they can get to a place where they can defend themselves. And we can give them the chance to survive and not only survive, but win. And so the king's scribes were called in verse 9. The third month, that is, is other than seven, and on three and twentieth day thereof, which means it's now about eight and a half months until the day comes that the Jews are all supposed to be killed. They've, they've got eight and a half months now to get the word out. The Bible says that they brought the scribes together and they made a new writing. It says the deputies and the rulers of the provinces which are from India unto Ethiopia and 127 provinces unto every province according to the writing thereof unto every people after their language and to the Jews according to their writing and according to uh, their language. And he wrote in uh, the king Ahasuerus' name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by post on horseback and riders on mules, camels, and young uh, dromedaries. If you just jump with me for a moment up to verse 13. It says, The copy of the writing... For a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people. They sat down and he to publish the message of their salvation. The message of hope. The fact is we don't have to stop and publish the message of hope. We've got it already. That's one step we don't have to take. It already exists. Look at verse 14. So the post that rode upon mules and camels went out, being hastened and pressed on by the king's commandment. The post, the messengers, they went out now, hastened and pressed by the king's commandment to get this word out. They've started two months late from the word that went out to kill the Jews. They're behind by two months and they have to get the word out. They have, they have about eight and a half months left and they're traveling on, uh, it says here, they're going, they're going, by, uh, uh, they're going uh, uh, by mules and camels. I'll be honest, I've never traveled on a mule or a camel. I sat on a camel one time. That's the extent of my knowledge of how quickly you can travel on a camel. It does not seem to me that it would be very comfortable and you'd be able to go very long, very far, very fast. But I don't know. Mules, I've been around a couple. Never sat on a mule. Never rode a mule. So I'm guessing, I, I don't know this for sure, but I don't know that eight and a half months is much time to try to get this message to 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. There was an urgency. There was an urgency. I say to you tonight, there should be an urgency in our lives. I don't mean to diminish at all the, the importance of this situation, but we're talking about men's lives here. We're talking about men's souls today. There is a difference. 
person can die and go to heaven. But today we're talking about souls. Truth, friendship, world evangelism. I ask you, where is the urgency in your life? This morning, Brother Moreland asked you, when have you died? What a great question. Tonight, I want to ask you, where's the urgency? Add to that. Add to that. You see, urgency, urgency will be seen in our prayer life. In every case, as the urgency came upon the people in this story, every case they cried, they wept, they fasted, they prayed. Only you know whether or not there is urgency in your prayer life. I'll tell you this, and I'm not psychic, I'm not, I'm not like that, but I know this to be true because I know it happened to me. This church prayed different the day you heard that your pastor was being rushed back into surgery last summer. You prayed different. You have them on your prayer list. You prayed. You said, Lord, bless the Sexton, bless the Thomas, and bless the Fox, and bless the... And you, and, and, and you have your prayer list, and you pray for these folks. But that day, you prayed different. You prayed, and you cried. You prayed with, with tears. You, you prayed and said, God, please just save him. Please bring him back to us. Please give him strength and health. You prayed differently because there was an urgency. There was an urgency. You know what it means to pray with urgency. A time years ago, when my children was in trouble, I prayed differently. I'd see their picture on the wall and I'd cry. And I'd, cry with tears. I prayed for them because it, there was an urgency. It was different. You know what it's like to pray with urgency. Do you pray with urgency about, uh, about the things? Listen, I love sports and I'm as political as they come. But it frustrates me that people know more about the, the NCAA playoffs or the or baseball scores or who won the Masters and, 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 and they know which candidates have how many delegates and which, and which caucuses and primaries are coming up. They, and, and, and that's much more on their hearts, much more on their minds, and much more on their tongue than the work of God and the salvation of souls and the reaching of people around the world and the planting of churches. Because there's not an urgency. So we talk about it like we do all the other news of the day. Where's the urgency? When's the last time you fasted over a spiritual need in our world today? Most of you have heard this story before, I'm sure, but the story is told that the devil was meeting with some of his key lieutenants. He was asking them for ideas and how can we how can we take more souls to hell? And one of them said, Well, let's tell the people that there is no God. He said, That'll work with some, but it won't work with most because the heavens declare the glory of God. Creation shows them there's a God. Most aren't going to fall for that. Some will, but most won't. Another one said, well, let's, let's tell them there's no judgment. And he said, no, they have conscience. They, they, they know in their heart that there's judgment. They know there's accountability. That, that, that'll, again, that'll work with some, but it won't work with the masses. The third one said, well, I have an idea. Let's just tell them there's no hurry. And he said, Brilliant. Brilliant. That's the answer. We'll just tell them, yes, there's a God. Of course, you could believe in that. Yes, there's a judgment. Sure, that's coming, but there's no hurry. Take your time. Don't let it too much affect your schedule. Don't let it too much affect your life. Just no hurry. I mentioned a little while ago I was saved. It was in the military. I was overseas in Okinawa, Japan, and and um, a neighbor friend of mine had befriended us and 
invite us to church. We'd never been to Baptist church before in our life. I was raised Catholic and uh, I knew all about the bells and the whistles and all the other stuff, but I didn't know about just yelling at you. We went to this church and the guy just stood up and yelled at us, sort of like I'm doing today. But You know, the first Baptist preacher we ever heard in our life was Dr. Don Sisk. He was there for a missions conference in Okinawa and a friend invited us to come and we went in. I don't remember hardly anything he said, but I do remember this because I had started listening to some some Christian music. I was listening to Doug Oldham. And one of the songs he sung was, uh, was, was, was God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. And I liked that song. It was upbeat. It was exciting. I liked it. So I had that song in my mind. Brother Sis got up and he said, let me tell you something. Some people say God said it. And I believe it and that settles it. Well, let me tell you something today. God said it. Doesn't matter whether you believe it. That settles it. To this day, I've never forgotten that because it connected with that song. Whoa, that's, that guy. We left there that day. I said to my wife, I said, that wasn't church. That was a lecture. And I didn't mean like a college lecture. I mean like dad in my face, red face lecture. I thought, I've just been yelled at. We don't worry about that. That was all new to us. But we got saved a few months later or a few weeks later. We, we came to the Lord as our Savior. And so we, we uh, uh, you remember Brother Bingham. Dr. F.R. Bingham was preaching the night we got saved. And he was preaching a revival meeting. He walked down the aisle. And Brother Kennard knelt with me at the front pew as I prayed and asked the Lord to be my Savior. I, I like to tell this part of the story. I, I, I didn't know my wife was going to get saved. I just was so under conviction that when the invitation was given, I just got up and walked out the, the aisle this way and I went forward and I knelt down and I, got, and I got saved and I was sitting on the front pew of the church and I had my face in my hands thinking to myself, all these years I thought I was a Christian. All these years I would have gone to hell. And I'm, I mean, I'm sitting there just thinking about this and just thinking about the, the, the seriousness of this. And, so, and next to me on the pew, there's some woman that's just crying. I mean, annoyingly crying. <laughs> disturbing my thoughts, you know. And so I did one of these numbers. I kind of looked through my fingers to see who it was. And it was my wife. We've been married less than a year. And I looked at her, I said, what are you doing here? And she's crying. She said, I just got saved. I said, me too. <laughs> Man, we were new at this stuff. We didn't know anything. We know a little bit more now, but not a whole lot. But we didn't know much at all. People just told us, you know, you got to believe this book. I said, okay. Amen. She said, I get baptized. Said, okay, fine. Good enough. Guy came to me. Do you know, first time I went out on bus visitation, I was visiting for about, half, about a half hour before I knew I was on bus visitation. The guy said to me, he said this, he said, he said, hey, what are you doing Saturday? I said, I don't have any plans on Saturday. He said, put on a tie. I'll pick you up. I want to take you somewhere. I said, okay, good. I was ready. He picked me up about 10, 10, 30, and we're driving down the road. He goes, hey, I want to stop over here. Just Come with me. And we got out of the car. We got up to this. He, he said uh, to these kids, he said, hey, you guys going to come to church Sunday? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're coming. He goes, oh, good. I want you to meet this. This is Greg Boyle. And I said, uh, I said, hi, how are you doing? And then he said, okay. We got back in the car. I figured now we're going where we're going to go, okay? And we went a few more blocks, and we pulled over. He said, hey, let me introduce you to somebody else. Just here, I'll come with me. We made four or five visits before I understood that's what we were doing. <laughs> I didn't know a thing. I got a letter from my mother. You remember, none of my family back home knows anything about this. I'm trying to figure out how do I tell. My dad told me one time when I was a teenager, he said there's only three things I could ever do that would totally disgrace him. One was if I ever turned my back on my family. The other was if I ever turned my back on my country. And the third was if I ever turned my back on my religion. I'm thinking, how am I telling my parents that we're Baptists? I didn't know what a Baptist was. So I didn't know how to tell them. But I know I say, and I wanted to tell them. I wanted them to know. But I got a letter from my mother and said that my Aunt Esther, I had an Esther, an aunt, my mother's aunt, 
And today in Esther is sick. She's just diagnosed with cancer. I thought to myself, I need to tell my mother and dad real quick because I want to say something to my aunt. I want to tell her how she can be saved. I want to tell her. And I knew that if I sent her a letter like that, she would then call my mom and say, hey, what's going on with Greg? So I needed to tell my mother and dad. And then I could tell my aunt, so here's the, the plan I devised. I devised a plan that I would write a letter to my aunt, kind of a preparatory letter. I would tell her that I'm praying for her. I would tell her that, you know, God cares about her. I'd say some general things that would get her ready. And then, in the meantime, I would send a, a cassette tape. We used to put recordings on things like that. Anyway, um... And uh, 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 I said, this, there's a cassette tape home. And it was about an hour long. I was going to tell my parents all about our salvation, what happened. I was going to explain the, the, the message to them. I was going to give them the plan of salvation. And I, and I had all planned out. And I did. I did exactly what I, uh, I sent a letter to, to my aunt. And then I, uh, and I prepared this, uh, this a cassette. When my parents got the cassette, they called the Catholic priest over to the house to listen to it. <laughs> I witnessed to him too. Anyway, and um, and uh, so 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 they they uh, you know so I was going to get all that in motion and it was all going. And as soon as they got the tape, then I was going to call my aunt back, write her another letter. So you know, I wanted to get the message to her <clears throat> before I could get the cassette tape. I mean, it was sent. It was gone. I was I I was I was doing what I had planned. I wasn't just putting it off. But I got a phone call from my mother and said, "Just want you to know, Aunt Esther died." Oh, but she called me and read to me your letter. She told me how encouraging it was. She said, Esther cried when she got your letter and couldn't believe how kind you were to write a letter like that and how much it meant to her. I never gave her the gospel. It was in my plan. I was planning to. I wanted to. I intended to. But there certain was, certainly was not an urgency. There was no urgency about it that day. That changed my life. I'm not saying to you since then I've always given the gospel every time I should, but many, many times I've thought of Esther and said, don't put it off, don't put it off. I don't know where my Aunt Esther is today. But I know she didn't hear the gospel from me. Because in my heart there was not an urgency. When there's an urgency in our lives, there will be different prayers. Our priorities will change. What we give our time to and what we give our talents to and what we give, 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 uh, give our money to. Our priorities will change when there's an urgency. Our preparations will change. Our prayers, our, 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 our priorities, our preparations. It'll be more important to, to think ahead about what we're going to do for God, how we're going to reach certain goals, how we're going to do, do, do certain things, what, 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 how God's going to use us. Those, those preparations, those, those ideas, those plans, they'll become more important to us when there's an urgency in our life. As I said when I started, many of us, many, many of us will say amen to everything is said over this pulpit over the next four days. And then we'll go home and pray the same. We'll have the same priorities. But for somebody, somebody here tonight, my prayer is tonight will change. There will become an urgency. And this thing, this thing about where America is going, this thing about where where our faith is going, this thing about, about planting church, this thing about reaching souls, this thing about building a bus route here or getting involved in soul winning here or doing something here will become important to you because you begin to see the urgency of it. Oh, that we like Esther would quit trying to solve it with the wrong answers or quit trying to make excuses and just 
get a hold of the urgency of it. Realize that we have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And if I perish, I perish. Where is the urgency in your life? Father, thank you so very, very much. Thank you for the privilege of sharing with these people what you've laid upon my heart. And Lord, help me not to lose sight of the fact that this message was for me as much as anybody in this room. Help me not, Lord, to, to lose the thought of the urgency for my own life, for my own prayers, for my own priorities. Help me, Lord, please. That there might be an urgency in my life so that whatever influence you allow me to have on this planet, that it would be an urgency that I could, like Mordecai shared the urgency with Esther. May my life make a difference and help somebody else to get a hold of the urgency. May I feel the pressure of necessity. May I, Lord, feel the pressure of, uh, of importance requiring immediate or speedy action. Father, please. We don't know how long we have. Please help us to sense the urgency of it. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.